Jesus said to his disciples, All power is given me to me in heaven and on earth. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Words taken from the Holy Gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. When St. John of the Cross was asked about his deep attraction to the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity and why he would often pray the votive mass of the Most Holy Trinity whenever he could, he responded simply, the Most Holy Trinity is the most holy thing in heaven. That's why he was so devoted to the Holy Trinity. Once in speaking on this beautiful mystery of our God with St. Teresa of Jesus in the parlor of the Carmelite Monastery in Avila, he levitated off the ground. Surely what he spoke of was not some dry dissertation. Once when this saintly friar was called to exercise a nun possessed by the devil, it happened to land on the eve of this holy feast day. It was about one o'clock when the little friar, John of the Cross, he was small in stature, short in stature, began the solemn prayers of exorcism. But the devil resisted. And the hour of vespers came round before the fiend could be driven out. The nuns and the clergy retired to the chapel to chant this hour of the divine office. Amazingly, the possessed nun was there too. The Deus Sinagitorium Meum Intende of the Vespers of Holy Trinity was solemnly intoned. And when the choir were singing the Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, the possessed nun who was occupying her usual seat gave a kind of half leap into the air and remained suspended upside down with head downwards and feet upwards. What a sight. And she was then completely inverted. As we can easily imagine, the nuns, dismayed and alarmed, stopped the chanting of the office. St. John stepped forward to the middle of the choir and said in a loud voice, By the power of the Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, whose feast we are celebrating, I command you to return this nun to her place. The nun turned over and acquired a normal position and returned to her own seat in the choir. When vespers were finished, the exorcisms continued until the nun was freed. The devil not only hates Latin and Gregorian chant and does all he can to stop it, but obviously he hates his own maker, the most holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. This hatred is perfect and cannot be undone. It's complete. This is why the devil can never change or be rehabilitated or be released from damnation. It is everlasting. But let's pause a moment and think about this scene of a nun floating upside down inside the chapel of a religious house. It is an image of a high-level diabolical disorientation of an inversion. When this happens, the religious stop praying. They stop chanting the office. They leave off their prayers. People become confused. Does this sound familiar? Think about it. Did not Sister Lucia say that the church has entered a time of diabolical disorientation? Have not our religious for the most part, stopped chanting the office, have left off praying and are no longer using Latin. And let's face it, they're confused, dismayed. Where are the religious? Where are their vocations? How often do we see a nun walking down the street or teaching in a class fully habited Do we need to say any more? We know the answers. 
But stay the course, dearly beloved of God. For there will come a time when all this diabolical disorientation will be reversed. And it will be done quickly, just as St. John did with this possessed nun. The confusion will dissipate. The chanting of Gregorian chant of beautiful psalms will resume. Latin will be loved. And the devil will be cast out. In any case, we can see the power of the Most Holy Trinity in conquering the devil also in this scene, in casting him out of our lives. And this is also and always done through the making of the sign of the cross. All throughout an exorcism, it is this sign made in the name of the Most Holy Trinity that ultimately frees the possessed soul from the grip of Satan and all evil. Let us then spend some time today convincing ourselves of its goodness, its power, and the need to make it well and make it often. To use this sign of the cross is ancient, it's apostolic. Listen to St. Augustine. He says, Paul carries everywhere the royal standard of the cross. He fishes for men, and Peter marks the nations with the sign of the cross. Thank you, St. Augustine. St. Basil the Great. To make the sign of the cross over those who place their hope in Jesus Christ is the first and best, primum est et notissimum, first and best thing known among us. Thank you, St. Basil. St. John Chrysostom. The cross is found everywhere with princes and their subjects, with men and women, with slaves and freemen, and all mark it on the most noble part of the body, the forehead. Never cross the threshold of your houses without saying, I renounce Satan and devote myself to Jesus Christ, accompanying these words with the sign of the cross. Thank you, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ambrose, we should make the sign of the cross at each action of the day. St. Gaudentius, let the sign of the cross be continually made on the heart, on the mouth, on the forehead, at table, at the bath, in bed, coming in and going out, in joy and sadness, sitting, standing, speaking, walking. In short, in all our actions, let us make it on our breasts and all our members that we may be entirely covered with the invincible armor of Christians. Thank you, St. Gaudentius. So let us keep in mind the ancient tradition of this sign of the cross is always made in the name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The sign has always been used of the great king of France, Louis the Ninth, St. Louis the Ninth. It is reported at table, in the council, in the combat, and in every action, the king always began by the sign of the cross. No wonder he's a saint. When the two great fleets of the Muslims and Christendom met at the Gulf of Lepanto, one of the greatest showdowns in the history of the world on the ocean, October 7, 1571, now the feast day of the Most Holy Rosary. The Muslims arrayed themselves in the shape of a huge crescent, their symbol. The Catholics arrayed themselves in the shape of the cross. Can you imagine watching from the air a crescent coming to meet the cross on the water? All these hundreds and hundreds of ships. What a fantastic sight. Stay tuned. You will see it in the general judgment. On the outcome of this one battle depended the safety of Christendom's future. Before the attack began, the Christian hero Don Juan of Austria made the sign of the cross and all others with him. The Muslims were roundly defeated. After a century or so, they tried again by coming around on the land this time to conquer Vienna, the gateway to all Europe. The great hordes of Muslim warriors surrounded the city for months only to be vanquished by a much, much smaller force led by the heroic Polish king, Jan Sobieski. 
Before descending upon them in open war, he made the sign of the cross on his army. He himself forming a living sign by hearing mass with his arms extended as if he were crucified. That's how he heard the mass. It was there, says a Christian warrior, that the grand vizier was overcome. And as they came down the mountain to attack, they yelled, Jesus and Mary, while the Muslims yelled, Allah. These are not the same. Among all the church's practices, the sign of the cross is the principal and most ordinary, the most familiar. It is the soul of her exorcisms, prayers, and benedictions. Without the sign of the cross, says St. Cyprian, nothing is done validly, nothing is perfect, nothing is holy. It is the key to the power of the Savior over all heaven and earth that we heard about in the gospel today. We baptize with the sign of the cross. We pour water over the baby's head or the neophyte's head in the sign of the cross as we pour. This is what perfects it. All the sacraments are done in the sign of the cross and in the presence of the cross. It is the key to the power of the Savior over all heaven and earth. Through it, the church takes possession of all good things, St. Augustine, it is thou that has willed this sign should be imprinted on our foreheads. The key that unlocks the door to heaven, folks, is in the shape of a cross. There's no getting in without it. When we prepared this church for sacred worship, it was marked with the sign of the cross. One was even erected on the place where the altar would be. As the church teaches in her councils, let no one dare to build a church without calling the bishop to the place that he may make the sign of the cross there in order to chase away the demons. To make this permanent, we place this sign all around and at the highest point of the church. See, dearly beloved of God, the conduct of the church towards man, the living temple of the blessed Trinity. The first thing she makes over him, as we've mentioned After his birth is the sign of the cross in baptism. The last, when he returns to the dust of the earth, is again the sign of the cross. Behold her first greeting and her last farewell to the faithful soul. Every part of the priestly vestment that he wears, every element at the Holy Mass is marked with this sign. The priest not only makes the sign of the cross numerous times, but becomes himself a living sign holding up his hands. Clearly, this sign is powerful. It is not useless or of little importance or superstition. What kind of beings, we might ask, do not make the sign of the cross? You ever think of that? Pagans, they do not make the sign of the cross. Muslims, they openly admit their hatred for the sign, removing it, tearing it down, and preventing its use when possible. What about the Jewish people? They too have rejected the sign and openly so. What about those who have split away from the church in heresy? Those claiming to have reformed the church, in other words, the Protestants. They too do not make the sign of the cross and refuse to do so. It's always mystified me. What can possibly be wrong with saying the sign of the cross if you're a Christian? Don't make sense. It means you're too Catholic. But perhaps most shameful of all, bad Catholics, stained or soiled with their sins, renegades to their baptism, slaves of human respect, haughty in their ignorance, they do not make the sign of the cross. At least not readily. They're too embarrassed to be known as Catholics. Or rather, making it might bother their conscience. I hope we do not ever be classified among them. Do not be afraid to make this sign, no matter where you are. I remember flying in jets, having to travel, and I was afraid, oh, I don't know, I'm going to pray the rosary. Should I make the sign of the cross? So, you know, I'd make the little tiny sign. I wake up, what am I doing? I'm a Catholic and I'm proud of it. Make the big sign of the cross, you know. I'm Catholic. 
Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We might add that beasts do not make the sign of the cross. What a grace then. What a privilege. What an honor to know this sign and to make it on our persons. Thus St. Cyprian said, O Lord, holy priest, thou hast bequeathed to us three imperishable things, the chalice of thy blood, the sign of the cross, and the example of thy sufferings. The sign of the cross, imperishable. In hoc signo vinces, Constantine saw in the sky and was victorious. Now we might consider, as I want to do at times, the via negativa, the negative way. We look at the opposite. Who doesn't like the sign of the cross besides the Muslims and the, the, the Jewish people, the Protestants, the pagans, and bad Catholics? God forbid we ever come one. Who doesn't like the sign of the cross? Who seeks to disorient this sign? But those that inhabit the devil's city, the devil's camp. Anton LaVey, he's the founder of the Church of Satan in America and the author of the Satanist Bible, the Black Bible. Often he used the peace symbol as the backdrop for his altar. What's the peace symbol? The upside-down cross. Listen to a convert from Wicca, a witch, in other words, speak on the subject of the peace sign, which is none other than the upside-down cross. She said, The peace sign is an ancient and powerful symbol of Antichrist. During the Dark Ages, it was used by the Druid witchcraft and by Satanists of all sorts during the initiation of a new member to their order. They would draw the magic circle on the ground and give the initiate a cross. The initiate would then lift the cross and turn it upside down. He would then renounce Christianity in all three dimensions of time, past, present, and future and then break the horizontal pieces downward, forming the design of what she calls the raven's foot. This ugly symbol is nothing short of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. For one to wear or display this symbol is to announce either knowingly or unknowingly that you have rejected Christ. Wow. Wow. In regards to this peace sign, one only need to consider the Gothic vestments worn by priests. We sometimes wear them. We don't have that many. We wear Roman vestments like this one. But a Gothic vestment is the one that's got the vertical bar with two bars going like that. Looks like a Y. Take that vestment and just turn it upside down. What do you get? The so-called peace sign, folks. It's inverted cross. We should take such symbols seriously because they are a mockery of what is holy. And they show us what is good. Turn it around, you got the right symbol, which is what the priest wears and the Gothic vestment. So let us be sure to rid our houses and our lives of this so-called peace sign. It is not about peace, folks. Looking at the members of God's holy city, we might note St. Bernadette. She started her victorious campaign against the world by trying to make the sign of the cross and could not until Our Lady taught her how. Herein lies the answer to her strength, her courage, her perseverance. The Immaculate Lady in the niche teaching her how to make the sign of the cross well. That's how she began her relationship with the Lady. Going back to the beginning, when Our Lady first appeared with a gust of wind on the 11th of February, 1858, Bernadette rightly reached into her pocket to retrieve her rosary and make the sign of the cross. But she wrote, my arm fell back until she was taught how to make it well and with Our Lady. She once corrected a fellow nun on how to make the sign of the cross. The sister answered that certainly she did not make it as well as Bernadette. After all, the little saint had been taught by the Blessed Virgin herself. 
Nevertheless, St. Bernadette responded, you must think of what you are doing then, because it is so very important to know how to make the sign of the cross fervently. How right she is. So in the Latin rite, we make the sign of the cross, at least in the Mass, with a flat hand for the five wounds of Christ. In the Easterns, they usually make three fingers for the Holy Trinity. Five for the five wounds, three for the Trinity, on the forehead, on the breast, on the shoulders. Nice, even sign of the cross. Not kind of, what's that? People make some kind of a weird sign. You can't even recognize it. That's not the sign of the cross, folks. Let's do it right. These are times of diabolical disorientation. Let us be confident that this too shall pass. All the while making the sign of the cross often, as the saints have taught us, for all we do from the beginning to the end of all our days and upon all that is in between, and making it well, fervently, as St. Bernadette recommended. For as St. Basil said, it is the first and best thing known among us. And it is what will bring us the victory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.